and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Wang Lomang in Beijing. Vietnamese-U.S. ties are expected to move forward with the three-day visit of President Barack Obama to Vietnam. What is at the top of his agenda, and is the U.S. intention of improving relations with Vietnam aimed at containing China's growing power in the Asia-Pacific region, especially the South China Sea? And how will his visit to both Vietnam and Japan contribute to his Asia-Pacific rebalance strategy before he leaves office? To discuss all these issues and more, I'm joined in the studio by Einar Tengen, an author and columnist, and Ye Hailin, chief secretary of the Center of South Asia Studies at the Chinese Academy. Of social sciences, but before we get started, let's take a look at this. On May the 22nd, U.S. President Barack Obama arrived in Vietnam for a three-day trip. It's Obama's first and the third by a sitting U.S. president to the country since the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. And on Monday, President Obama announced that the U.S. had fully lifted its ban on weapons sales to Vietnam at a joint press conference alongside his Vietnamese counterpart. President Tran Dai Quang. We've agreed to continue deepening our defense cooperation, including patrol boats and training for Vietnam's Coast Guard, and to work more closely together in responding to humanitarian disasters. And I can also announce that the United States is fully lifting the ban on the sale of military equipment to Vietnam that has been in place for some 50 years. Obama also made it clear that the United States may sell military weapons to Vietnam on a case-by-case basis. Both leaders attended a signing ceremony celebrating a series of new commercial deals between American and Vietnamese companies. The United States and Vietnam have experienced an astonishing turnaround in their relations, from bitter foes scarred by a decade of war to regional allies, as the U.S. seeks to build its relationship with its Pacific allies. On Tuesday, Obama is flying to Ho Chi Minh City, the southern Vietnamese metropolis and the country's thriving commercial heart. Later in the week, Obama will fly to Japan for a G7 summit. Now let's turn to our studio guests for more discussion into this,、uh, Mr. Ina Tengen, Mr. Ye Hailin. So certainly this is a very historic visit, but my question is why now? Because expectations were high last year that President Obama should be making a visit to Vietnam when it was marking the 20th anniversary of the normalization of ties. What took him so long? Uh, I think he was、uh, he was busy last year, and there were real questions about、uh, TPP and things like this. I, I really, you should look at this in perspective. Despite the the big announcement of the arms withdrawal, this is really the last gasp for his central policy, which was his pivot to Asia, which is based on TPP. Without with TPP floundering, with three of the candidates who、uh, who are. Running for president, saying that they will not renew it, that they see this as negative to America, this will literally undo his entire legacy on this pivot to Asia. So,、uh, I, I'm not certain that, that this is anything more than ceremony and symbol. Maybe the last chapter of his book where he's trying to make breakthroughs, but I don't see it as lasting. Well,、uh, Mr. Ye, do you、mm-hmm. see any significance in terms of the timing?、Uh, we compare with the last year. Actually, that there is no significant change between Vietnam and, and, and the U.S. between the、uh, among the South China Sea. So I think it's only、uh, mainly because of the、uh, President Obama want to make this visit as a final of this、uh, Asia policy. That's a very symbolic、uh, action towards Vietnam. Just like we all know, they already make the breakthrough on Cuba. On Iran, so、mm-hmm. why not Vietnam? So if if the DPRK, I will be surprised, but Vietnam, I won't be surprised. Okay, so he's been trying to consolidate in his legacy, and、uh, President Obama also announced the most significant development yet during his visit,、uh, saying that the U.S. wants to lift the arms embargo on its former enemy, and many see this arms embargo as the last remnant of animosity, animosity between the two countries. So do you see that it has the potential to really get past historical? Grievances, Mr. Tangen?、Uh, no. I, well, history is history, and I, I don't think、uh, there's a lot of animosity that continues, at least on the U.S. side.、Um, but you just be very careful when you say that. Remember, when he was speaking, he started talking about Coast Guard. And disaster relief and things like that. He and it was a case by case basis.、And、the reason is he does not have the power to see this thing through. He's a lame duck president who's on his way out in a Congress who is hostile. 
to uh, these types of situations. They brought up uh, the issue of double standards which are being applied. Vietnam for some reason got a very, very easy pass on a number of issues, social issues that TPP was supposed to be championing. And there are many in Congress and in the European Union who are questioning this. And so I don't think that he is speaking for the world or the United States at this point. As I said, and I would yeah. agree, this is about ceremony and it's about his legacy. So, do you see any significance in terms of lifting this ban? Does it? Of course, they were lifting this ban. They will uh, release a very strong signal to the Southeast East, uh, Southeast Asia country mm -hmm. to say America will back up their action towards a certain partner or target. But uh, meanwhile, we would like to recall another example that between U.S. and uh, and India, there is no any ban towards India. But still, the arms sale is very slow and very some only symbolic. But the reason is they take a very long time. And also, for the other side, I mean, Vienna and the India. Actually, the Vienna is more even a uh, little bit difficult than than India. They have another uh, resources. They can buy their weapons. They Russia. Mm -hmm. So for even for Vienna, I think the American is very important. But it's, this importance is all for, also for symbolic. It doesn't mean the Vienna really require a huge bunch of the U.S. weapon. To defend themselves, because they have another another channel, they can easily to get what they want from Russia. And, and, Russia and, and, used and to be the main weapon supplier. Still, and, the number one. Still, right. they're uh, they're supplying these new submarines and things like that. So is, the, is the U.S. trying to? Um, Want to keep with you, 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 this is symbolic. The, yeah, you know exactly please, please. what he said. You know the reason that they're not selling to India is because there are still Russian technicians who are making mm -hmm. repairs and who are at these army facilities. They, the U.S. is not going to sell first-line weapons to a place where, you know, Russian yeah. <laughs> technicals can come over and take a little look-see around. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. They don't want uh, the Russians studying, especially at a time of heightened tensions. So I, I really do uh, agree with uh, my my. Colleague here, this is purely symbolic. This is just a uh, putting the eye on the last chapter of of Obama's legacy. Well, what could be the consequences, though, from this uh, lifting of the arms embargo? What could it mean? What could a stronger arsenal mean to Vietnam and in, even to the region? Mr. I, I don't think Vietnam really can get some uh, lethal weapons towards his uh, potential target, but there is enhance their confidence when in an involved the potential conflicts with their partner, mm -hmm. and also some some another ASEAN country probably will. We will learn from this. Okay, if I pro American more, probably I will also on the list, or I will also be backed up by the United States and cause some tension in the South China Sea. It's it's possible, but it's not because of the United States. It's because of the Asia country how they read this, and nobody can guarantee you read this, you, the, the the reading of the some certain countries they are right or wrong, or suitable for the fact or not. Mm. You know, you go back into history. I mean, Vietnam had very difficult relations with its neighbors, and there were a number of wars that were fought and uh, continuing uh, kind of animosity. This kind of arms buildup in Vietnam is not just aimed at China. All right, the other countries are going to mm -hmm. feel more nervous. They mm -hmm. once again are going to say, "Okay, we need to beef up our things." This is the wrong time for this to be happening. You know the the um, the, prime, uh, the secretary identified 50 billion of needed infrastructure. I have not heard one single sound about from the U.S. government saying that they're going to be putting this money in. Right? They're asking them, in essence, yeah. to buy more, to go more into debt when they really need to be taking care of the butter issues, the bread and butter issues that are going to feed people and keep this economy going. So but, what exactly is going on there? What is the U.S. intending to do in Vietnam well, without having to you know, help with the infrastructure? I think this is a last moment thing, and mm -hmm. I, I think the, the situation in the Philippines has really thrown them for a loop. They were expecting uh, you know, the kind of status quo to happen. They, they really weren't prepared for Duarte. And with Duarte saying, look, I, I'm going to put four people <laughs> into my cabinet from the Muslim side. I'm going to increase. If we're having a problem with China, I'm going to talk to him directly. Yeah. This is really going against great. So I think this was something that was very last moment. It was it's sh trying to be a signal of strength that the U.S. is still here, mm -hmm. that the, Asia, the pivot to Asia mm -hmm. will continue in some form. But as I said, when you start looking at it on a granular basis, their, their willingness to sell mm -hmm. arms, mm -hmm. what this means uh, leading to arms races, 
places and other places. It, it doesn't make sense. So yeah. you yeah. think this is a last minute decision? It's yes. ceremonial, it's symbolic, no, but uh, I, I, what could be I the logical read. thinking behind this? Actually, I think there's also another factor involved that's the domestic situation of the Vienna, especially their party. Because we know just a couple of months be, uh, 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 ago, there was a party change, party mm -hmm. leadership change in, in Vienna, and uh, basically all the major leaders came from the north. And usually the South is pro-American more than the North. And this time, I think when the Americans want to send a strong uh, information or a signal to the Vietnam side, it's also to show they want to uh, normalize and, and enhance their relation with the Northern part, I mean the, the hardcore of the right. Vietnam Communist Party. Right. But the, meanwhile, we, we can notice that President Obama also paid a visit to two cities in, in Vienna. It's a twin city story, and these twins also indicate the north and the south. So I think this is a very difficult choice. You know, if you only go to Hanoi, maybe the northern part will pro your United States much more than right now, but you also go to the Ho Chi Minh city. Mm. What I mean? It's not only Beijing and Shanghai that's simple, because in, in the history, in the Vietnamese history, the northern and the southern, they involved a very long time, very bloody civil war in, during the, the 1960s and the 19, uh, 1950s and the uh, 1960s and 1970s. Mm. So it's really difficult for the United States to maintain the balance in the very critical moment of the Vietnam domestic situation. And another challenge is that despite high-level exchanges between the United States and Vietnam, it seems that there's um, what many describe as the American syndrome, that's the older generation of, Viet of Vietnamese officials who fought during the Vietnam War, they remain wary of the fact that Vietnam is trying to, you know, warming up ties. So could this visit in any way alleviate that suspicion? No, I, I don't. I, it's, it's very hard to see into the minds of these leaders, but I, I think if you start, you know, take away the press conference, take away a very charismatic uh, president, and you start looking in the cold light of day at what you actually have. And what I said, <clears throat> at the end of the day, they don't need more gunboats. What they read is, need is more infrastructure. They're having one of the worst droughts in their history. All right, they need water. The water is in China. China's already making allocations. This is not a situation where the, uh, Vietnam needs to be making enemies with its neighbors. It's an outward-facing trade uh, economy. They need to be uh, making friends, not enemies. So. I don't think that this is going to be anything more. When you ask about the rationale behind it, I think purely building a legacy. What can we learn from um, this decision in terms of Americans' long-term interest in Vietnam and, and even the entire region, Mr. Ye? I think if the, 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 the China and the U.S. relation goes pretty well, Vietnam's importance will go down very slowly and very quick, actually very significant. But now it's time that it's different because American, uh, the, especially for the President Obama, still want to keep this legacy on the pivot to Asia. So and the chi China definitely is one of these targets. So using this flag can easily to help Americans to sell this uh, pivot policy. But the question is that it's not a first year, it's a, the last year of the pivot to Asia. So how you can guarantee the, 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 the neighboring countries still buy this commitment Although, if you check the history for the last eight years, there's not, not much improvement. Mm. You, you see, there, there's another reason why it's Vietnam as opposed to somewhere else. Vietnam is unusual in Southeast Asia in that it has trade uh, deficits with China and trade surpluses with the U.S. Mm -hmm. Its economy is 20% trade based towards the U.S., only 10% towards China. These are due mostly to historical uh, issues. But when you start seeing that, it's one of the only Southeast Asian nations to have this kind of situation. So it's easier for the U.S. to go to Vietnam and say, look, you know, we're, we're trying to be friendly. We're, we're going to overcome all of these obstacles. But the real question is, who's going to take over the helm in the presidency uh, next year? Mm. And what that will mean for this yeah. uh, TPP and the Pacific to Asia. Yeah. I think it will be massive changes. Gentlemen, on the economic front, um, mm -hmm. Vietnam and the U.S. are both members of the TPP and mm -hmm. President Obama is still trying to push through Congress on this. And if the TPP does come into effect, what could it mean to Vietnam? Could trade with the U.S. surge even further? Well, it could. I mean, but you, you, let's start looking at the, uh, at the economy of Vietnam. What they're doing is it's cell phones, cell phone parts. A lot of it is, is textiles, things like that. These are primary economy things. These are the things that used to be made in China. 
All right, mm. and have moved down there simply because the wage rates are quite low. They have a large uh, um, young population. They've been growing at seven percent, near seven percent. Uh, they, unemployment is very, very low. Everything looks good on paper, but there are other issues in terms of corruption, transparency, um, a number of how you structure uh, down there. So, and the the real feeling in the international business community is: is it sustainable? What will happen in five to ten years down the line mm. if they don't get this infrastructure in place? If they do, they will have a very nice success story for quite some time. Right, even though it is now the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia, gentlemen, we'll be talking about the strategic elements later on in the show. But now let's take a short break. Welcome back to Dialogue. Well, gentlemen, let's talk more about the economic fronts, uh, economic cooperation between U.S. and Vietnam. So, what could be the potential? Because Mr. Tengen just said that mm -hmm. infrastructure in Vietnam yeah. is still lagging. Of course, it's um, it's not catching up with mm -hmm. its economic development. So, why is Vietnam such an attractive market to the U.S.? Well, I think it's more strategic than anything else. I mean, it, uh, obviously, the U.S. is trying to stir the pot on the China Sea issue, and uh, you know the the overtures to um, the Philippines uh, that are now in question. There's really not a lot of targets. They, obviously, Japan is there. Uh, South Korea seems to be going its own way in mm -hmm. a, a lot of respects. So instead of this kind of united front that was an encirclement uh, type of strategy, they're now losing pieces. And this, this is, uh, I think, is bothersome to the State Department and especially to Obama because he was counting on creating this network based on trade, the TPP, to create this pivot to Asia, to keep um, the U.S.'s relevance high, and to contain what they saw as a resurging, uh, as a surging China. Mm, do you think that trade and investment still uh, will remain the um, the foundation for U.S. engagement uh, in Southeast Asia? I don't think Asia. America has the intention to put a lot of money into the Vietnam market. It's, okay. They may they may be they may make a lot of commitment, but the, if you check by the data, by the numbers, probably still go very slow because for the overseas investment now is not a priority of the United States economy. And meanwhile, we should point out. For the Vietnam, the prospect really of the prospect of the Vietnamese economy is laid on their relation with the, the ASEAN members, ASEAN member That's country. Right. It's the in, regional integrity of the Southeast Asia, not only on the TPP. Actually, if TPP really fulfilled and put in, uh, uh, put some uh, actual in, impact towards the regional integration, will lay a very serious problem for the ASEAN because we all know if the ASEAN was divided. And this whole region's economy prospect will be very, very negative. Such as we can see this, why China is a, has a huge market because for us inside China, every province is same and equal. Mm -hmm. They don't have any custom. They, they don't have any tariffs. We can easily to communicate and uh, transport to any part of uh, uh, any devices. But in, in Southeast Asia, the problem is maybe the one part of the car you came from the Thailand, and another part you came from Vietnam. How do you combine them together, make the assembly? And this this issue only need uh, could be solved by the regional integrity, means the RCEP, mm -hmm. not by the TPP, because the own, not every ASEAN member is the member of the TPP. How TPP can put all the ASEAN member together, especially for Vietnam, we can we can easily to calculate. Among the, all the ASEAN 12, uh, the TPP 12 numbers candidates, Vienna is left behind. Mm. Well, if we look from a broader perspective, though, it seems that the regional bloc, I mean ASEAN, mm. has grown so big that uh, it's attracting attention from a lot of countries. Uh, the U.S. wants to engage mm -hmm. with Southeast Asia. Why is that, and what can Vietnam deliver in this? Well, actually, I think the, the U.S. has not thought this out very clearly because by emboldening uh, Vietnam, Vietnam has had questionable relations, as we were discussing with its neighbors, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, and there are other people who will say, well, why not? Like we were discussing earlier, Myanmar. Myanmar is sitting there. We have 50 million people. We've just recently become a democracy. Uh, why aren't we getting some love? What, where, 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 what's going on? But the big issue is, and I, I agree with you, where is the meat? Where's the money for the, what is actually necessary to make Vietnam and ASEAN stand up, which is this infrastructure? China is offering it. China is 
trade and development. The U.S. is still, even by the State Department issued their, their statement today, trade and security. So you have two fundamentally different ideas about what the future entails. One of them says that China is an, is an issue and you need us to protect you and meanwhile we'll trade with you. But for most of ASEAN, not including Vietnam, their surpluses are with China. They want to continue uh, attaching themselves to this very, very large market that is offering development to them through these packages, uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. So w will Vietnam be able to make this choice between China and the U.S.? Uh, I don't think Vietnam will really make the, the choice between these two uh, giants in, 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 in Vietnam's uh, perspective because it's, really, really, really not, uh, it's not an option. Mm -hmm. For instance, Vietnam even though America can provide so-called maritime security for Vietnam, I doubt it. But still, Vietnam is not an island, hundred miles away from China. It's mm -hmm. our land. This land. It's a land neighboring country. So how you can keep away from China? It's it's highly unlikely. And so this is the priority for Vietnam security, and this America is nothing to do. So only provide so-called maritime assistance for Vietnam is not enough. But to provide some actual protection, is highly impossible. So even for the security aspect, I don't think America can really make the commitment uh, seriously to make the Union you know, change their long-term strategy doctrine. So, and, but for economy, just like Tanner uh, raised the point, it's quite simple. Still, China is the number one market for Union. So this, think about it. It's not a very difficult choice. Hmm. Well, uh, President Obama said that the relaxation of this arms embargo has nothing to do with the U.S. policy on China. He says this is just to complete a lengthy process of normalization of ties. But how much <laughs> do you think it has to do with well, China? It has how, how does it understand do. the strategic No, concern? no, come on. Let's be serious. You know, politicians say, uh, make broad statements, but this is clear. There's, there's no real material objective for the United States in this type of engagement. In fact, Obama had to reassure everybody who was joining TPP that uh, it eventually Vietnam would conform to the kind of social pressures that they were putting on them, I mean, labor and freedom of this and that and the other thing. So they were an outlier and he's been trying desperately hard to bring them in with the carrot of TPP and this type of thing. It just, it, it doesn't make any kind of sense except as part of this kind of overall strategy to contain China. And you mentioned uh, security cooperation just now, Mr. Tengen, and it seems that uh, Vietnam and the U.S. have their MOUs outlining the, um, the priority areas in their cooperation, defense cooperation, maritime cooperation. Mm -hmm. So is that going to be upgraded, that relationship? <laughs> well, I'm going to agree with my heart. I don't know what it means by upgraded. I mean, if, if, if uh, there was some talk prior to this that Obama was going to try to trade this arms embargo lifting in order for access to Kamran Bay, mm -hmm. all right, which is a, a big natural deep water port where you can, um, you know, there were aircraft carriers there before. I don't know, obviously that didn't happen because we haven't heard that, mm -hmm. but I don't think that that would be seen very well by China. Yep. And I don't know that the rest of ASEAN would be very, very pleased about having it. You already have the kind of uh, bases set up in, in, um, in Japan, uh, Okinawa and those places. That's not going very well. Mm. The situation in the Philippines is going along, but it's not going the way that we expected. So uh, there are massive cracks that are appearing in this initial policy that they've been pushing for eight years that uh, the U.S. was an engage in a constructive way in the specific in order to counter a rising China. Right. And meanwhile, actually, there's a lot of uh, other things, additional measures could be done. Firstly, the uh, United States may uh, invite more Vietnam military officers to the United States to receive some training to launch some dialogue or a, con uh, a conference, between, uh, seminars between the UN United States and the Vietnam Army. And this to build up a so-called so confidence building towards the Vietnam military staffs. It's, ho it's highly possible because they don't cost you very high, because it basically it's for, for free. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they can uh, send a very strong uh, signal to the Vietnam military staffs and build some pri private connection. So it's, it's very convenient for the for, for US to enhance their uh, influence towards the Vietnam military but mechanism. It's also a possible measures. It doesn't require the, the, the very high value of the arms sale. 
But I, I, I don't know voice. what this it, it means in the end. The idea of a land or navy war in the South China Sea is repugnant to everybody. Everybody loses. It's not just China. All of ASEAN loses if there is a problem uh, getting trade in and out of, the, of those areas. The U.S. loses. Europe loses. This is a, a, a situation where there will be absolutely no winners. Now, historically, you've had situations like that and you still had hostilities. Mm -hmm. But right now, the time should be let's quiet things down. Let's get to a reasonable basis where we can start talking about the issues in a reasonable yeah. way. This was not aimed at that. And as I said, I'm, I'm very critical because I see this purely as legacy building. And of no course, substance. Mm -hmm. right. And of course, President Obama will be touching on uh, some very sensitive issue, and that's how the two sides is going to work out their um, the lingering effects mm -hmm. of Agent Orange and the unexploded um, the unexploded ordinance in Vietnam. So, what role do you think history will play in their relations going forward? It tries to override the history, so the re uh, even rewrite the chapters. So, but the question is that. The, the people has their own memory. Not only the President Obama has their, their own memory. A lot of the Vietnamese, especially the veterans, they have their own memory. Mm -hmm. So there will be a problem. But I think for both sides, uh, I mean their, their, their leadership, they have some uh, common basis to override this. So it won't be a very serious difficult for uh, at least for during this visit, the things will go very smoothly. Uh, no. You can wait for the, the background moment. But uh, uh, to, to add on to that, yeah. I don't think the level of dialogue between the U.S. and Vietnam is at a very high level. I don't think there's this great understanding. These were uh, two countries who were in disagreement. There is some feeling among young people, especially mm -hmm. in the South, that they like the U.S., they like the U.S. culture. But you're talking about two very, very different uh, societies and, and ways of thinking. And I don't think that there has been this thing. I mean, there's unfortunately sometimes this idea in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that everyone believes, as we do, in this kind of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. and the end of history, this model of, of democracy and um, free, free markets. And I don't necessarily think that that is the way people think there. Well, the U.S. and Vietnam have taken some very impressive strides um, mm -hmm. after the war ended. But, of course, a lot remains to be done. Let's talk about this. Uh, clearly, President Obama wants to build his legacy, but the problem is whether his legacy will be inherited by the next president of the United States. Your view on this? Uh, no. I mean, the only one that would continue down this road, of course, would be Hillary Clinton. But she has already publicly backtracked a number of times, especially on TPP. She says, uh, all of a sudden, from being the greatest thing on Earth when she was <laughs> in the State Department, and we have to, we have to do this, it's essential, she backtracked and said, well, you know, a lot of things I'm hearing are not what I like. It's not fair. I'll protect jobs. Every time she goes to a, a state that has a large automotive industry all of a sudden it's like no no this is not the way to go I know so she's backtracking maybe these are just political moves but no matter what happens there's going to be a Congress waiting and remember this is a tripartite system of government president does not make these decisions on mm -hmm. their own it is clear the American public does not like this idea. They see TPP as an extension of NAFTA and they saw that as a disaster for the American economy. Not that it was, but the perception is that it was. And now let's wait and see if more strategic meaning will be added to their existing cooperation framework. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for your discussion on this. Mr. Yahadian and Mr. Aina Tengen, appreciate it. And that's all we have for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Mamang. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.